just going to turn that sound off real quick. Whoops. Hello again everyone and welcome back to Wonderful Aircraft Weekly. Today we're talking about super maneuverability as I mentioned in my video last week I will be talking about this this coming week. In short, super maneuverability is generally the ability of an aircraft to maneuver outside the capabilities that are attainable by pure aerodynamic mechanisms. This was first seen uh, in 1975 by the F-15 Stull slash MTD, it's quite a mouthful of a name. Um, it was researched in the US, uh, it, was, it was a proof of concept aircraft essentially, um, and this was long before aircraft that are well known for super maneuverability like the MiG-29 and Su-27 became to be. However, this was not the first time super maneuverability was used. Super maneuverability was used in the Falklands War by the Royal Navy with their Sea Harriers. They would do a technique called viffing or vectoring thrust in forward flight. They would use it to, because I'm sure as all of you know, the Harrier is a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and can direct its exhaust gases downwards. So they would do that while in forward flight in order to make a very tight turn and uh, gain an advantage on an opponent, and that is technically super maneuverability as you are operating uh, maneuver outside of normal aerodynamic capabilities. And this was used to great effectiveness in the Falklands War, even though the Harrier has a fairly high wing loading. With normal aerodynamic maneuverability, an aircraft has normal control surfaces like ailerons, flaps, elevators, rudders, and such that are used to control the aircraft, to create directional force on the aircraft, creating pitching, rolling, and yawing motions. Now, these forces are different at different speeds. At slow speeds, they tend to not be as effective as there's not as much air moving over the control surfaces, so they can't deflect the same way they could at a higher speed. But at the same time, at even higher speeds, the aerodynamic stresses of high speed, of whether it be supersonic flight or not, means that the control surfaces are, again, less effective. So every aircraft has what's called a cornering speed or a maneuvering speed. Now with an aerodynamic, general, a normal aerodynamic maneuverability, you have to maintain close to that corner speed as much as possible to get the most out of your aircraft. Now with super maneuverability, this is not the case. Super maneuverability allows a pilot to maintain control and continue pulling hard maneuvers below cornering speed. Super maneuverable aircraft also demonstrate the ability to maintain a fairly consistent altitude even at very high angles of attack and slow speeds. And this allows them to also maintain control of angles of attack over 90 degrees, which is not generally uh, possible with a purely aerodynamic maneuverable design. Super maneuverability can be attained in different ways, but super maneuverability itself, as it's defined, is the ability of an aircraft to maintain very high alpha and still be in control and perform maneuvers like the famed Pugachev's Cobra or the J-Turn. To be super maneuverable, generally an aircraft has to have very good post-stall characteristics. Normally an aircraft, when it's in a stall, doesn't have a whole lot of control. Normally the pilot can sort of wheel the stick back and forth and nothing will happen. Now with a super maneuverable aircraft, they are able to maintain at least some limited control even while in a stall. Thrust to weight ratio is also a very important thing in a super maneuverable aircraft and that means that the power that is being produced by the engines is equal to or more than the weight of the aircraft. You need to have, well you don't need to, but generally you need to have close to a thrust to weight ratio of one or greater for a super maneuverable aircraft. That means that the aircraft can maintain a fairly consistent altitude even when at high angles of attack and low speeds because the engines, ha they produce more force than the aircraft weighs. So it's relatively easier for the engines to keep the aircraft in the, uh, in the air even when the wings are producing minimal lift. Now, of course, also an aircraft that is super maneuverable has to have good high aerodynamic maneuverability just like a traditional aircraft. So it has to have large wings, it has to have a, a fairly low wing loading, good ways to produce extra lift like uh, root gloves, strakes, canards, whatever it may be, 
has to be aerodynamic, and in so on and so forth. Despite the aerodynamic maneuverability of a super maneuverable aircraft, one requirement that is necessary is that it has to be inherently unstable. Now, an aircraft, just like any other thing in the world, has a center of gravity. And with a traditional aircraft, there is another point called the aerodynamic center. And now on a normal aircraft, that would be behind the center of gravity, whether that means, like, on this aircraft, it would be somewhere around here, let's say. I don't think that would be where it actually would be at, but that's just using that as a reference. So that would be the aerodynamic center right here. That means that if this aircraft were to experience a gust of wind or whatever, or some sort of disturbance while it was flying, it would naturally just go back to the way it was, and meaning without any pilot input, meaning that it's consistently stable just aerodynamically. Now, with a super maneuverable aircraft, this is not here. The aerodynamic center is in front of the center of gravity, which is a very unusual design, but it means that this aircraft always wants to increase its angle of attack, making it very maneuverable and quote-unquote stable in a high maneuverability phase of flight. But if you're just trying to fly straight and level, and you're trying to fly a aircraft with its center of aerodynamics in front of its center of gravity, then it's going to be very hard to control in normal flight, and that's where a system called fly-by-wire comes in. Essentially what fly-by-wire does is that when the pilot's just flying straight and level, the uh, computers in the aircraft are making minute adjustments to the control surfaces to keep it stable. So it can still be stable and feel stable in a normal phase of flight, but as soon as you need to kick it into high gear and start maneuvering like crazy, you can do so better than any other aircraft. Canard controls are also a very handy thing to have for super maneuverability. They are not a requirement per se, but they are a benefit in some situations. Essentially what a canard is, is a elevator control surface in front of the wings as opposed to behind them. Elevators in general, and normally where they're placed behind the wings, have some disadvantages as there is turbulence that comes off of every aircraft's wings. However small it may be, it is going to interfere with the deflection of the traditional elevators. And in this way, canards have benefits as they are not disrupted by the turbulence over the wings. In some aircraft, canards are used to supplement elevators or in some cases completely replace them. They can be used not only to control pitch, but have also been used to control roll. Canards largely help at high angles of attack as they help direct the airflow down over the wings, allowing the aircraft to have more lift even at high angles of attack. Some aircraft you'll see as they go to high angles of attack, the canards kind of automatically point downward, and that's for that same kind of reason, to sort of deflect the air downwards and try and keep as much of it going over the wings, even in that kind of extreme flying. They can also increase radar signature, which was one of the main reasons the F-22 does not possess canards. Other aircraft like the Su-35 also do not possess canards, even though they're definitely super maneuverable aircraft. Something that's also important for any sort of maneuverability, but especially super maneuverability, is a low wing loading. And if you want to see exactly what a low wing loading is, or exactly how it works, you can check out my last video right over here. Now the last thing that is very important to super maneuverability, not necessary, but it is very important and very helpful, and that is thrust vectoring. And I'll go into a little bit here, but I did explain that in a previous video, which you can also watch right here. Um, but I'll explain it briefly here. Essentially, thrust vectoring directs the engine gases in a different way than straight back. So it, if they're pointed up, they push down on the tail of the aircraft and increase the pitch authority greatly. And this allows the aircraft to not only have greater pitch authority in all phases of flight, but maintain control when there is little to no airflow over the traditional control surfaces. You know, you'll see some of these Sukhoi aircraft kind of go up like this and then they'll just kind of slowly fall down like this, that would be almost impossible without thrust vectoring because the thrust vectoring will allow you to maintain control even though there's no real airflow over the traditional control surfaces. It is not necessarily a requirement. As mentioned before, the Cobra, it doesn't require an aircraft to have thrust vectoring to be able to pull that maneuver. The SU-27 
have thrust vectoring, but it can do it. The MiG-29, the early versions didn't have thrust vectoring, it can do it as well. So it's not necessarily a requirement. And the F-14 was actually the first person, or first, first person, first aircraft to be able to do or be documented doing that kind of maneuver. It never had thrust vectoring at all. So it is a very important asset in super maneuverability, but it is not necessarily a requirement. So that is essentially super maneuverability. That's what it is. It is be the ability of an aircraft to fly outside the envelope of traditional aerodynamics. And those are the reasons why it can do that. So I hope you all enjoyed and learned a lot from this video. If you did, please feel free to give a like, leave a comment letting me know what you want to see next. And without, with that, keep calm and fly high, and I will see you next time.